Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's Demo Day. My name is Kelly McDonald. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm honored to be here. As an out LGBTQ plus founder, a member of Startout who's previously served on the programming board, and my prior to my company, Kindu, being acquired last year, I was a proud graduate of the Startout. Thrilled to be your MC for the evening. Startout accelerates the growth of the LGBT community to drive its economic empowerment, building a world where every LGBTQ plus entrepreneur has equal access to lead, succeed, and shape the workforce of the future. Over the past 12 years, we've built a community of currently 18,000 members, and we individually support nearly 400 entrepreneurs every year. Our programs are open to all LGBTQ plus founders who could use some extra support and a supportive community to accelerate their growth. In terms of our programs, we provide individual support through community events, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, one-on-one -on -one office hours with experts and connections to a community of investors interested in investing in our community. We also run a six-month accelerator program called the Startout Growth Lab. Since our founding, 56 graduated companies have raised $592 million in funding and created over 3,400 new jobs. If you'd like to join the community, please visit startout.org. Applications are open all year long. And for ecosystem builders and investors interested in supporting underestimated founders, we'd love to collaborate and provide access to a diverse pool of incredible founders. If you're interested in exploring how to work with us, feel free to reach out after the event. And if you're watching me, then you've made it to the Sella events main stage, and we're super glad you're here. All of today's presentations are going to take right here, take place right here on this page. And hopefully you've had a chance to file. If you haven't, go to your top right corner where you're going to see your name, click on the drop down menu, and then click edit your profile. Having more information in your profile will allow you to network with more like-minded individuals throughout our time together. And there's a chat function also available to your right where you can meet and get to know other attendees. You can add their name, invite them to chat or video chat and find out more about each individual. On the left navigation bar, you can click on workshops to join a networking session after the presentations are over as well, or visit our founder and sponsor booths. The founders will be in their rooms during the judge's deliberation period and after the winners are announced. So you can keep scrolling down and you can visit the virtual booths from our generous sponsors and you can also learn more about us here at Startout. If you want to chat individually with someone, just click their name. Their profile is going to come up and you can either connect to them directly or send a message by clicking on the chat bubble. You can also click the three dots and schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them. It's all really simple. And if you have any questions, just let us know in the chats. If you have any trouble whatsoever, please click the chat button in the bottom right-hand corner or email us at info at startout.org and we'll help you out right away. Now at the top of the page next to the chat tab, polls are going to appear for, who to, for you to vote on who you think should win at the end of the presentations. We're gonna launch those polls during each Q&A to let us know also if you'd like more information on the founder or if you wanna connect with them directly. Please do not participate in the polls until we prompt you. And I promise I'll make sure you know when it's time. Our demo day event would not be possible without the generous and continued support of our sponsors. And this year's main sponsors for today's event are Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, and Amazon Web Services, AWS. We'd love to have them share with you why they're here today. So please first join me in welcoming to the stage Ari Kalfayan from AWS. Hi, Ari. How are you? I'm doing well. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes. Cool. Well, welcome, folks. It's an honor to be here and co-sponsor this event along with SVB. I'm here in beautiful Las Vegas. I'll give you guys a peek in the suite at Remars, one of the big conferences for AWS, and I just got off the stage, so I didn't prepare at all. So <laughs> we're in good company. Uh, I thought we would just chat a little bit about the entrepreneurial journey here for a second before we get started. Um, I think it was 13 years ago, I was a failed demo day contestant, right? Like totally didn't win, probably didn't even get a vote to be in the top three. 
And like fast forward 12 years, I've created a billion dollar company with weights and biases. And I'm like interviewing Insight Partners and Madrona and like three of the biggest ML founders in the world. And I think what a lot of people don't talk about is the process and the support you need to become a successful entrepreneur. One, coming from an underrepresented plot, like founder background or LGBT background, often we come from backgrounds where we don't have the right resources and we don't know what it takes to build these companies. And it's an iterative process that takes a community to teach us how to actually become a successful entrepreneur and support us through that journey. So I think going from that like failed demo day and startup experience and continuing at it and having 10 startups and finally hitting one and then joining AWS, one of the things that I've really focused on in my role here at AWS running our early stage AIML BD practice is actually giving back to the community. So whether that's AIML entrepreneurs or any underrepresented entrepreneur, Everyone in my peer group cares about giving back and creating a more equitable ecosystem, which is why we sponsor Startout, right? We think it's amazing. I've been a part of it since day one when Lorenzo founded it with a bunch of the other Startout founders. And it's been amazing to see the transformation, right? Like now there's access to funding. Now we have demo days. Now we have like investor portals and meetings. We have help with go to market. An amazing uh, set of events that actually help you in that journey to become a successful entrepreneur. So if I wanna leave you with one thing today, whether you're a uh, attendee or a judge or a uh, startup that's pitching, this is part of your journey. And whether you win or lose, whether you learn something new, it's, it's something that you're gonna soak in and you're gonna look back to later and say, wow, that was profound. So really excited to be here and excited to hear about all these amazing startups. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, and to share a little bit more about Ari and his background, he's actually spent his career supporting, mentoring, and investing in underrepresented founder startups. Um, Ari's focus at AWS is actually helping early stage co-founders co who are building machine learning startups, accelerate growth, technical development, and achieve product market fit. Now, Ari is also an early stage startup investor through his new syndication, Next Wave AI. Uh, next, I'd like to bring up to the stage Dave Mullen from SVB. Dave, come on up. Yes, and great to meet everybody. Calling in from a way less glamorous place than Las Vegas. I'm in a sweltering San Francisco right now and also going to take a different spin with the shameless plug for SVB. Um, first and foremost, happy to be here. Looking forward to meeting a ton of you and, and hearing your stories, but Silicon Valley Bank, just for those who aren't familiar, is a premier tech bank. So we're the largest tech bank in the U.S. by market cap, 38,000 clients globally, 78% market share of tech companies IPOing, 50% of U.S. VC-backed startups. Um, all in all, just uh, mention that because we, we are there to support you at the earliest stages through IPO, and I'm happy to field any and all requests after this about driving you to get guys to the right people. Um, just in terms of SVB Capital, which I sit on, we are focused on Series A and Series B FinTech, Enterprise, and Climate Technologies. Um, happy to also field conversations about that for those who fit within those parameters or who have questions about what that might look like further. Lastly, I'd like to say SVB has always been a very proud sponsor of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, that includes sponsorship of Startout, that includes our work with our Pride Employee Resource Group and, of course, uh, attending events like this. So honored to be here. I appreciate everyone's um, willingness to come out here and, and shoot your shot today. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And to share a little bit more about Dave, prior to joining SVB Capital, Dave was an investor at Wells Fargo Strategic Capital, where he focused on venture growth investments in the technology sector. And he currently is, serves as the prop tech vertical lead at Emerging Venture Capitalist Association, where he focuses on engagement and programming. Now, additional sponsorship for this event has been provided by Embroker and Zendesk. And we would love for you to meet those incredible companies and learn more about why and how they're supporting and their booth later today. Now, alongside their sponsorship and the commitment to the future of the LGBTQ plus entrepreneurship, you've just met two of our five judges for this year's demo day. 
Now, I'd love to take a moment and share a couple of more judges here that we have. So our other judges could uh, join on stage, and I'll briefly walk everyone through who else is helping us out today. Thank you. So first up, we have Adam O'Donnell from Zendesk. Adam runs a startup partnership for North America at Zendesk. As a former founder himself, he also previously worked as an investment associate at Silicon Valley VC, where he reviewed more than 2,000 high growth startups. Uh, Ashley Flukas, a managing partner of Flukas Ventures. Ashley is the founder and general partner of Flukas Ventures based in West Palm Beach, Florida. The syndicate of around 2,000 angel investors has already invested in more than 250 startups. And Jason Scott, he's a partner at the Anim Fund, uh, an early stage venture fund based out of New York and London. Prior to Anim, Jason led Google's startup developer ecosystem and has been responsible for launching and running funds and accelerator for Google worldwide, including girl, Google's accelerators for black led, women led and climate focused companies. Jason also launched Alphabet's Black Angel Group in early 2001, 2021, sorry. Uh, now, the prizes today uh, for Demo Day, thank you judges so much for joining us. We'll call you back up later. Uh, we do have some prizes for Demo Day that we're very excited to talk about. Uh, the cash prizes in today's event will total $10,000. And there will be $5,000 award for first place, $3,000 for second place, and $2,000 for third place. Beyond the cash prizes, the winners will also receive support from Indentifier, who's offering three hours of curated UX UI consultation for the first place winner and perfectly pitched who's offering $750 worth of coaching services to our second place winner, whether that's advising on branding, designing for a pitch deck, public speaking coaching sessions, or anything else they offer where thank you so much to those uh, sponsors as well. Now the list of founders who are participating today is Geo Pogo, Hear Here Market, Inclusion Score, Innovar, Raya Health, Selflessly, and Smart Sweet Tech. Our founders are going to have three minutes to pitch their companies, followed by two minutes of Q&A from their judges. Now, once all the companies have pitched, the judges will go to the deliberation room and choose the winners. Let's get started. Uh, first up is Nick Martin from Carbon Reform. Nick? Thanks, Kelly. And hello, everybody. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Nick Martin. I am the co-founder and COO of Carbon Reform. We are a women-owned and certified LGBT business enterprise that has developed a technology to remove carbon dioxide from inside of buildings. So most people know that current level of atmospheric CO2 is around 400 parts per million. But what people don't always know is that CO2 can begin to affect human health at as low as 550 parts per million. And in offices and schools, this number continues to climb. So what we've developed is a modular solution that retrofits into a, building's a commercial building's ventilation system. And as return air passes through the return air duct, which is rich in CO2 from human respiration and outdoor air, we essentially divert part of that into our device where it adsorbs to our proprietary polymer sorbent technology and reacts with a lime or calcium hydroxide input to produce a calcium carbonate or limestone byproduct. This byproduct is valuable and then can be sold downstream to heavy polluting industries like concrete and steel. So not only are we permanently sequestering carbon dioxide, we're also improving indoor air quality. And finally, for our commercial building owner operators as customers, we're reducing their HVAC energy load by cleaning more of the return air in a building. So when considering our market opportunity here and looking at the total available commercial real estate in the world and uh, using a bottom up approach for the price of our technology, it's about a $450 billion market. Additionally, there's pricing on carbon in places like New York and Boston, um, which are putting a regulatory pricing on carbon starting at as early as 2024. For our average commercial building owner and operator, they stand to benefit about $3.23 per square meter. That's about 30 cents a square foot per year in energy savings. In addition to be able to sharing in carbon credits with us on the open market, current carbon pricing is around $50 a ton. 
So despite being an early stage company, we have significant traction to date, including a joint development agreement with a Fortune 500 HVAC company, investment support from Exelon, a major US utility. Our first two pilot units are going out this year, which include a, the school district of Philadelphia, so we can see improvements inside of public schools. We have traction from the plug and play ecosystem, and I'll be traveling over to Japan next week to start interactions with large corporates over there. And we have a letter of intent pending for the first 500 units um, of our devices, approximately a $5 million value. This is my team, myself and Joe, our co-founders. We have Prashant and Rakesh, our engineers, and wherever we have gaps as a team, we have filled that with our advisory board. So we're currently raising a seed round of investment, which will give us about 18 months of runway and uh, increase our personnel lab space and convert provisionals to full patents and basically get us to early commercial scale by the end of next year with our first 40 units in production. So I thank you all for your time and I look forward to questions. Great job, Nick. Um, now the judges, I'll ask you to join us here on stage while I'll remind the audience that the polls are open here. Again, that is over on your right-hand side. You'll be able to say, yes, I want an introduction to carbon reform here. So make sure you answer that poll. And then judges, you're gonna have two minutes to ask your questions. Um, go ahead. Hey, this is Dave, Nick, and congrats on the traction so far. It, it seems like you guys are doing a great job for this stage. Curious on the commercial real estate side and your go-to-market strategy, who are you selling into exactly? It seems like these days a lot of REITs or commercial operators rarely have a CISO, let alone a buyer of technology, and it's a longer sales cycle. How are you thinking through that? Yeah, there's sort of two routes to market. One is leveraging our joint development agreement and actually exploring like a licensing play so we can integrate our core tech into um, one of our HVAC OEMs um, pro existing products. The second is going to large scale pro property developers as early customers, because not only do they have a lot of real estate, but they can use the device in current buildings and use the byproduct, this calcium carbonate to fuel the concrete in future construction. So they're really interested in like this closed loop um, um, system. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. Hey, great job. Hi. Oh yeah, you go ahead. Hi Nick, uh, Ashley here. I, I would love if you could uh, talk a little bit more, uh, kind of uh, like where your what your what your technical what your technical mode is, and and kind of how this compares to to the you know other other potential solutions or competitors. Yeah. So our closest competitor sort of does two of the three things. They are focused on a modular retrofit for buildings, um, and they focus on indoor air quality and energy savings. But what they actually do is when they they capture the CO two, but then at night when energy is cheap. They run heat over their membrane and re-release the CO2 to the atmosphere. So they can't really brand themselves as a climate technology. So for us, by being able to permanently sequester the CO2, not only are we climate tech, but we can capitalize on all these carbon credits that our competitors are missing out on. So Nick, I really love it. And um, we actually have a climate fund here at AWS and Amazon where we're investing in climate um, tech. So shoot me an email afterwards. I'll connect you to that team. Awesome. Thank you. Nick Adam O'Donnell here. Great stuff. I love the simplicity and I love how your, your slides went in the order for the judges uh, judging criteria. So you definitely did your homework. Um, quick, could you tell me more about your background and your team's background? Just diving in a little bit more um, would be really helpful. Sure. Um, my background's in chemical engineering. I've spent um, some time in the research space and renewable energy technology, biofuels, solar. Um, my co-founder Joe has a background in climate science and material science. Her PhD research is actually tangential to our core polymer chemistry. So that's been um, really a crucial. And then our other two engineers are mechanical engineers. So they're really helpful with the chassis and the mechanics of our device. Got it. How did you discover the pain point initially? Like who, who, who did the customer discovery calls? Unfortunately, yeah, was, I'm going to have to cut us okay. off here on there. I'm sorry, but we'll thank talk you so right. much. You guys can definitely nice. talk later in the booths for sure. Uh, great job. Nick, and next up is going to be Mike Hoppy from Geopogo. Mike, come take it away. Hello, thank you guys. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna set the uh, timer to start now. 
All right, happy Pride, everybody. Um, so thank you guys. Um, today I'm here to present GeoPogo and our platform called AR Instantly, uh, which is for the design and construction industry. Let's get started. Okay, so my name is Michael Hoppy. I'm the co-founder uh, here at GeoPogo, and I'm an architectural designer. I have 10 years of experience uh, designing buildings. Um, I'm a patent holder and a 3D AR pioneer. And our team is also a group of architects. So Dave Alpert, our CEO, is a San Francisco architect. And uh, we also have 3D engineers and gaming engineers on the team. And so the problem is really close to me. Um, I've experienced it many times. Um, it has a great deal to do with miscommunication. And did you know that over a billion dollars a day is wasted across the US because of construction rework? And that is because the average construction project is 80% over budget, 20% behind schedule, and 9% of it is avoidable rework. And the problem is because of communication and these, uh, these methods of communication, construction drawings, renderings, virtual reality, and on-screen animations, they're all isolated from reality. Well, we have an incredible solution. And that solution is augmented reality. That's the new Magic Leap 2 AR glasses. And we can now take architectural models and digitally project them on site. Architects use our software to digitally present the designs as if they're already built to contractors, clients, and project stakeholders. Our software has been proven to increase collaboration. People are able to edit designs on site and you can walk through the future of your design. It's just incredible. So this is our platform. It's an AR studio desktop editor that also has an AR app for iPhones and iPads. And of course, on the new Magic Leap 2 AR headsets. We are SaaS software. Our target market is BIM visualization managers at architecture and construction firms. Our customers have had incredible success. They've gotten immediate approvals. They've raised millions of dollars. They've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars from construction rework, and they've had great social impact. I have a couple seconds left. This is our core differentiator. We have in-house built tools that you can design buildings with. These are super powerful, easy to use tools anyone can use. Go on our website and download these, have some fun. Okay, a couple more seconds. We have granted patents, metaverse patents. Ask Dave, fast growing billion dollar market. We are partnered with Oracle, Magic Leap, and Siemens. We have thousands of users, and we're about to open a $2 million raise. Thank you, guys. Here is my contact info. Ask us for a live demo if you're in the Bay Area. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I uh, appreciate the time. That's it. Um, yep. So let's go ahead and make sure you guys check out the poll that will pop up right in front of you, folks. And then uh, go ahead and uh, judges, join us, please. And we will get started with the Q&A. So Michael, that's really, really cool product. AutoCAD kind of turned into like the dominant way people are programming or actually like building houses now. How do you become a dominant market force and make sure that everyone uses you? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Well, the first one is we also work with Autodesk. So all of Autodesk software products are able to import into our software to be viewed in AR. So that's one of the problems that we solved in terms of architects and designers getting their models into augmented reality space. So we work with Autodesk and we hope to have a partnership with them where we can integrate even closer with them. Um, on the alternative side, our easy to use design tools we see as an opportunity to open the market to millions of new designers that have never touched 3D before. And Autodesk software is incredibly complicated and complex. We plan for our tools to be much simpler and much funner to get into. Michael, Adam O'Donnell here. Quick question is what's the biggest uh, priority for the company? Is it the AR glasses or the software? Because they're both complex. <laughs> it's both. It's technically both at the moment. Um, Magic Leap, if you're familiar, is an augmented reality hardware provider. We're revenue share partners with them. So we're launching together. Um, we are launching our software on their headsets. They're preparing to release this summer. Um, and then we're actively building a go-to-market strategy together. So the engineering team is basically upgrading our platforms to the Magic Leap 2, and then we're actively pushing to, to sell to our new customers in the market. 
Hey Michael, this is Dave. To that effect, how are you thinking about pricing this? Is this kind of a multi-year contract? Is this per batch? Is it per headset? Uh, curious yeah. to more. We did two licensing, uh, licensing models. Um, with the original Magic Leap ones, we did a bundle package called Quick Start. And so Quick Start was $2.99 a month for Geopogo and a Magic Leap 1 headset. And then we sold those in batches. That's what we want to sell to them. For the Magic Leap 2s, we're going to do software. So Geopogo software, $99 a month per user or $9.95 a year per user. And then they buy a Magic Leap 2 at full cost. And so that's a bundle solution we give together. Um, but you buy the headset outright. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thank you, judges. Uh, thank let's, you, guys. Great job. And let's bring on up Nick Florek from Here Here Market. Hi, everybody. My screen. All right, can everybody see? Couldn't assume we're good. Um, okay, hi, we are here, here market. We're an online marketplace for food enthusiasts to discover and buy specialty products from chefpreneurs small batch artisans, and local product makers. My name is Nick Florek, and my co-founder is Dishu Gulati. Together, we bring over 35 years of experience in consumer products, retail, and food distribution. The last few years, we've seen an increase in our industry trends that were accelerated by the pandemic. Chefs started producing more packaged goods to diversify revenue, and there's been a sustainable surge um, in independent food brand launches. Now more than ever, these culinary creators have resources to make a sellable product, but it's extremely difficult for them to manage a digital presence and build reach. In fact, did you know that there's 30,000 new brands launched each year, but 75 to 95% of them fail? Here Here Market is solving for just that and aims to be the dominant digital platform for culinary creators. We currently work with creators who are building packaged shelf-stable goods like pasta and spices. Now, what truly sets us apart from platforms like Etsy are two things. We do focus market matching. We sell exclusively chef-driven products and artisanal goods. And then we do fulfillment. We provide everything to customers in one box, and we solve the biggest pain point for our creators by doing that. We launched our MVP in August of 2021 and are currently the largest digital marketplace in Chicago for chef entrepreneurs. So far in that time period, we've been $215,000 in revenue and have a 54% month over month customer growth rate. But our MVP in Chicago is just the start. We believe we can be a $170 million business by 2025 by taking a small fraction of a $100 billion market. We make money by charging a 23 to 25% commission on all transactions and offer a ro roster of supplier services to help our creators run and grow their businesses. Now, the culinary creator ecosystem organizes itself based on geographic communities, and we've successfully built a city-based creator acquisition playbook that's allowed us to onboard supply quickly and inexpensively in a tiered approach. We start with Halo talent, like Michelin chefs, who are often the center of these networks. These creator communities then become our preferred customer acquisition channel as we can leverage their fan base. Right now, we have access to over 500,000 eyeballs through our creator fan bases. Our in-house team is rounded out by phenomenal advisors, included, including Francisco Brahm, the former head of Uber Eats Global Product Marketing. Um, and last year, we closed an 800K pre-seed round led by our strategic investor, Gordon Food Service, and including venture capital firm, Sunstone Management. We're currently preparing to raise a $3.5 million seed round that will help build a scalable foundation to include a warehousing capability, um, our custom tech, and growth. Join us in building the number one culinary destination uh, for culinary creators in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Great job. We're also going to bring up your co-founder, uh, Disha Gulati, yes. for the Q&A. So while Disha is joining us up here, audience, go ahead and select the poll and judges, please join us on the stage. And Disha's there, so let's go to our judges. 
So I think I would ask a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned five markets in terms of uh, where you showed that your market prioritization and attractiveness and um, how do you pick which market is next? Yeah, so um, we've actually started to dip our toes in uh, other Midwest cities. And the reason we did that is because like any networks, um, there are connections between some creators in Chicago and Detroit. And um, it's easier for us geographically, especially with fulfillment. We can access the products um, a little bit easily. Um, but we believe once we um, kind of dip our toes in expanding into other markets and we build kind of the back end tech that allows us to have a little bit more automation and onboarding people, we can kind of open the flood bait gate. So we have a, a playbook that that we've created and we're building some automated tech to enable it to be a little bit uh, more seamless but um after our first set of expansion we can we can go to other cities pretty quickly and maybe just to add one more thing we actually have a pipeline of creators from other cities we are inbound interest um that we've held them at bay because we're building our our, our um, scaling capabilities but once we once we have that tech built out, then we're going to see where we see maximum interest in what, and that will also help us prioritize which cities to go to next. Hey, Adam O'Donnell here. Quick question: um, What? Yeah, and great, great job, by the way. Really excited to see. I grew up in Nashville, so I hope you go there soon. I'm in San Francisco. But um, how many okay. new creators <laughs> come from one event in terms of the viral loop that's being created from an event? Yeah, so we've onboarded over 100 creators in Chicago in this way, and, and we started with, with working with that Halo talent. But then what we also are able to do is build relationships with kind of these organizing centers that have shared kitchen spaces. So in Chicago, it's called the Hatchery. Many creators who are working in shared kitchen spaces work out of there. So we were able to build relationships with these single points of entry and expand on uh, from there. And the same thing is happening in other cities. I don't know in San Francisco um, specifically, but we know kind of there's new spaces in Long Beach, California called Partake, which is a shared kitchen space. Um, in Minneapolis, um, Canagra was supporting um, uh, or not Conagra, sorry, um, Eco, uh, Ecolab, I think we're supporting kind of a growth uh, a thing there. So this is happening all over. So we can tap into those specific modes pretty much anywhere. And sorry, one more thing to add there is we're also seeing a lot of interest from cities, economic development agencies that want to work with us. To sorry, Disha, we're out of time. I apologize there <laughs> for that. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, please uh, jump in and join them in the uh, booth here so we can go ahead and uh, get on to the next person here. So James Felton Keith from Inclusion Score, please join us on the stage. Thank you. Hey everybody, let me just share the screen. All right, I'm not quite prepared. All right, everybody, my name is James Felton Keith. I'm CEO here at Inclusion Score. We create the standard diverse inclusion operating system that is backed by the new ISO 30415 standard for diversity and inclusion. We are the team, our, my co-founders are the core team at the International Organization for Standards. If you're not familiar with the ISO, we've been making every standard that humanity is guided by since the end of World War II. Um, this standard took us about 12 years to create, uh, You know, if we include the, the past two of the pandemic, across more than a thousand experts and it's, been ratified in 163 countries. At this point, Inclusion Score, we DBA as Inclusion Corporation, is the largest certifying body across 14 countries in this particular standard. And our, our business is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're an insurance company, actually. And right now in the US alone, companies spend about $8 billion a year doing diversity and inclusion really related stuff. Meanwhile, most chief financial officers can't even define DNI and or what they would have their chief diversity officers do, you know, the KPIs that they'd use. Um, but our broader market, what we're looking at again, just here in the US is about $600 billion in corporate turnover. And most importantly, about $10 billion a year in corporate DNI lawsuits. And what that means is that turns into an insurance policy at the end of the day. You know, when a company, when a person leaves a company disgruntled and they leave under counsel and they're offered six months, 
that's the EPL policy, a DNO, a ENO policy. These are all sorts of insurance policies that trigger claims for companies that actually pay out. These are some data from some of our current partners like Willis Towers Watson, who owns the Sears Tower, is what I still call it in Chicago, or Gallagher. And these are metrics of a PIP up in DNO and employment practices liability policies over the course of the past decades. We currently have about 343 as of this week uh, companies on the platform across 14 nations. And we do business with some of the largest insurers on the planet. Currently, we have distribution contracts, which is the focus of our business with the largest auditing company on the planet, the largest insurance carrier on the planet, the largest independent broker trade association on the planet, the number one risk management university at University of Georgia. And we've convinced at least seven of the 55 insurance commissioners in this country to create regulatory guidance, similar to what we did about 10 years ago with cybersecurity to insist that firms have a DNI audit as it is a systemic risk. Our business model is pretty straightforward. We sell more expensive platform as a service, as a white label to big firms. We sell SaaS to everybody else. We are the certification body, but most importantly, we're a broker across these 55 states and growing in France and the UK and Spain. What we've done via insurance is effectively re-incentivized inclusion at the corporate level. While we love interacting with firms that have an affinity for DNI, I care more about firms that have employment practices, liabilities claims, and our ability to incentivize their broker to force an audit and the implementation. Thank you so much, James. That is uh, our, your time there. Uh, we are going to need to pop on the poll and have the judges come on stage uh, for their two minutes here. Judges, take it away. James, Adam O'Donnell here. Great, great stuff. Uh, very exciting about the insurance piece. Can you can can you tell me the percentage of your revenue that's currently of consult that's co currently consulting revenue versus PaaS or SaaS? I don't know if you heard that. I heard it, James. Can you hear us? No, I can't hear anything. Are you all typing or? Speaking. No, he asked what, um, sorry, Adam was asking if, uh, how much of your revenue is consulting revenue versus PaaS or SaaS revenue? Uh, right now it's about 50, 50. Um, we've, we've white labeled with, with Zurich. Uh, again, we do our, our class every year. So we, we've, we've made about 200 this year. Um, here's some, I can share screen with, uh, projections for the next year. We're not focused on, uh, subscription acquisition at this point in time what we're really focused on teams capacity is securing distribution contracts we want to duplicate what we've done with zurich and pwc about tenfold and spend 2023 pushing that out so we're doing a raise to really hire the necessary staff to put in place people that we think we already know we're pretty old team ranging between 50 and 70 years old and uh, most of the folks in our industry we have good access to we just need to be able to deploy folks. James, that was awesome. And I guess my question is, you said you have seven insurance commissioners who are thinking about the regulatory filing. What is it going to take to convince the rest? So I'm a retired politician. I previously ran for Congress here in New York's 13th. I live in Harlem. And we've convinced the National Association of Insurance Commissioners to push this out everywhere. We created a diversity board about a week after George Floyd was murdered and got all 55 of their buy-in. I think that we only need about 13 of their buy-ins. We really need California and New York, uh, which we already have, and a few others to fill in the blanks. There are only about 5.2 million companies that pay taxes in this country, and only about 60% of them are our ideal clients. Um, so regulatory guidance is I think that's already been capped. We don't need it state by state to, to really scale. Um, yeah, we've really done this before in cyber, right? When New York says, if you deal with the Department of Financial Services, you must have an audit, that's 70% of the well-capitalized world. So we've already completed that, which is why PricewaterhouseCoopers is our, our number one uh, client. Thank you so much, James. We appreciate that.
Um, and let's go ahead and we are going to bring on up AJ DeLeon from Innovare. AJ, take it away. Hi, everyone. How are you? Let me in here and we will get started. I'm AJ. I am the CEO of Innovare and our app Inno empowers education leaders to make data driven decisions that positive students and communities. We were founded in 2017 and our headquarters in Chicago. Education leadership is super hard. There are limited resources, inconsistent improvement, the environment keeps changing, especially post-pandemic, and leaders don't have all the data that they need to make decisions around in one single place, which is why our team that is super diverse and led by people of color and people who look like the people we're trying to impact and have the ex experience of having worked directly with leaders in education has combined our over 30 years experience to develop a solution for this. What we do is we support leaders to unify their usually messy data from various solutions, random Google spreadsheets, and the different constellation of data tools that they have for students into one single source of true dashboard that is personalized for them at their level. This is for the leaders, the principals, the superintendents, the board members, because when they know better, they can do better. They can actually make decisions that positively impact the people they serve. And our app is different because it's not just another dashboard, another sexy data tool. It actually combines and allows the leaders to see the equity and the inequities that are happening, but it also combines the OKR system to document a strategy and the impact that that strategy will have on the communities that are served. Our solution is e easy to implement. It's affordable at $15,000 for schools and $48,000 for districts. And we uh, know that there's a huge market in education. It's actually $3 billion just in the US. And we have captured a part of that. $2.1 million in sales with over 50 customers across 12 US states. We have already sold more than $2 million this year, which represents 100% growth from last year. And we plan to double again the revenue and triple it until 2024 and raise a seed extension round because last year we raised a seed round. So we invite you to first vote for us today. We would love to have the ability to continue to tell our story. We also want to connect with you either here live after the show, so to speak. And then if you are an accredited investor, talk to you next round. Again, we're Innovare. We've made over $2 million in sales. We impact education and support leaders to make good decisions using data. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Great job. Uh, let's bring up the judges. I think the poll has already popped, so hopefully everyone answered that there. And then uh, I will give the judges here their two minutes. Hi, AJ. Um, I, I guess I'd be curious uh, to learn a little bit more about your, your sales cycle and then also kind of what, what are the tailwinds you're seeing, obviously, having had the, the jump in growth uh, year over year? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So uh, the sales cycle is usually 60 days, so ex exactly 58 days, which is super fast for education solutions. And, and in terms of the tailwinds, we have actually focused a lot on doing yeah. events and also focus on the charter market because when the pandemic happened a lot of public schools really canceled so to speak their accountability policies whereas so we zeroed in on them and that has led to that growth that you've seen especially multi-year deals and charter deals hey this is dave and congrats on the traction so far curious are you guys building the API integrations and then the analytics layer on top of that? And that's fully fledged, built out already? Yeah, so we have a proprietary app. We actually started uh, building it uh, three years ago. Uh, our first MVP, which we made $400,000, like I said in the chart in year one, with zero dollars of investment. Uh, but last two years ago, we rolled out the app and what it does is it connects to the apis of the other edtech solutions so you know when you onboard on quickbooks and it says connect to this connect to your checking account yeah. connect to that that's sort of what we do and then we also upload and download csvs from systems that don't have apis so our team can do that work 
for the schools. For the schools. Yeah. Well, congrats. That's that's very capital efficient to do all that. All right. Thank you so much, AJ. Uh, and let's move to Dallas Barnes from Raya Health. Uh, Dallas, the floor is yours. Awesome. Let me share my screen here. Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Dallas and I'm the founder and CEO of Raya Health. There is a major health crisis within women's health that is not being addressed. That is birth control is often misprescribed. This leads to a grueling trial and error process where 75% of people who use birth control describe their experience negatively. It's also extremely time consuming and expensive. I have my own personal struggle with this problem. I spent years trying five or more, I think I tried like six different birth control methods, all of which left me feeling totally unlike myself. One method in particular, my body reacted so adversely that I was admitted to the hospital. I then launched Raya Health. Raya is a digital platform for personalized contraceptive counseling. We use smart algorithms and human-centered design to make navigating birth control easy, effective, and empowering for users. Our beta platform has a 95% user satisfaction rate. We save people time and money. We have a web-based service that is serving real people at the moment. This is our beta version. The screenshots that you see on the right there is our mobile app, which is currently in development and set to launch for September. When an individual interacts with our platform, they first log in, go through a questionnaire, which gives our system a comprehensive understanding of their hormonal profile, past experience with birth control, preferences, lifestyle, all of that good stuff to then match them to the best birth control option for them. We help them access those methods and our system enables them in tracking and monitoring any side effects or symptoms when trying a new method. This is for hormonal and non-hormonal options. We are working to scale to implement elements of machine learning in our matching system and bits of AI in our follow-up and side effect tracking system. Our initial target audience is young people who are struggling firsthand with this trial and error process. There are about 49 million people in North America who are frustrated and looking to switch options. On our board, or on our team, sorry, is myself. I am the advisor for Femtech Canada. I'm a reproductive rights and sexual health activist, and I'm a sought after speaker globally on these topics. Our advisors are super hands-on. I'm indebted to them. I would like to highlight a couple. Dr. Rahima is a lecturer at um, UFT at Planned Parenthood. Lindsay Chastain is our very hands-on marketing advisor. She was the growth and partnerships director at Ancestry and the digital marketing director at Sephora. Our process goes beyond birth control. We see our smart tech, uh, evidence-based science and our human-centered design process being replicated in other areas of sexual and reproductive health and wellness. We're currently selling our service direct to consumer to really establish proof of concept, which we have done. We plan to grow fully B2B and B2B2C by the end of 2023. We have two contracts secured with- Thank you, Dallas. Uh, we do have to uh, stop here. I appreciate no. you for sure. Uh, great job. And judges, let's go ahead and come on stage. Folks, you're going to see the poll. Make sure you do uh, work that poll for us. And then judges, it is on you for two minutes. That was great job. Adam O'Donnell here. How many users do you have that are paying that seven per month? Yeah, so we've worked with over 140 beta users so far on our platform. And we have active paying users, um, $7 a month. What percentage yeah. of those are active? 140 of them? Or... Active users, we have about 30 right now. We've had various versions of our MVP, and all together we've worked with one-on-one, -on -one, getting real great feedback from over 140 beta, uh, users. Sorry, 
We have two contracts secured with two top Canadian universities uh, for Rea Health to be a part of their student health benefit plans. So those pilots are launching in September alongside our mobile app. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Dallas. Real quickly, understanding it's early, do you guys have any cohort analytics understanding there may be some churn? Have you kind of seen any of that in the short lifetime of this product? Yeah, and that's the thing, we are still learning about that, but we are finding that um, when individuals are interacting with our platform so far, they are finding an option that they like and they love, and then they're interacting with our platform thereafter um, for three to six months. But again, we're still, we're still understanding how long people are really sticking to that platform. And the more we are expanding into these other areas, such as post-abortion care and STI counseling and support, um, which our members are already asking us for, we do see that LTV extending quite significantly. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that personal story. I mean, um, it's still early, but how are health systems actually reacting to an app like this? Have you had those conversations? Yeah, um, for sure, definitely. So we are so it is a little bit different. We found that the younger female physicians are our champions. They get it. They're really excited to direct their patients to credible online resources. Um, some other physicians, there's a little bit more of a pushback there, um, but we are leveraging those um, medical communities. Our board is super awesome extending their network and their community to us. And just within my own work um, within the femtech space, we have that network that one, it helps us build up that credibility, but is then that um, that ref referral community for, for those patients. So. Thank you so much, uh, Dallas. We, uh, are up on our time here on this one. So we appreciate this. And then let's uh, jump on over here to Josh Driver. Uh, Josh, take it away. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. All right, a little computer. Let's get started here. Okay, hopefully you're not seeing an embarrassing Asa Base playlist on, on iTunes. So it's my pleasure to- We don't see anything. You don't see anything? Um, I don't. Your screen hasn't popped up yet. Yeah, Josh, if you want to put it up, I can let you know when it pops up here. Is it working? Still nothing? Viewer? All right. We'll just go back to the backup plan here. Do you see a screen? Uh, not yet, Josh. Uh, yep, now I do. Here we go. Now it's there. Awesome. Cool. You're there. Okay. So you didn't see the embarrassing iTunes playlist. No, we did not. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for your time. It's an honor to tell you about my company, Selflessly. Uh, great loading screen, by the way. Thanks. At MacBook. All right. So. Selflessly was born out of a nonprofit that I started in 2015. Uh, we are here in Indiana. Indiana. Uh, you may remember the RIFRA Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I created a nonprofit in partnership with Angie's List and Salesforce to create a global directory of over 100,000 businesses that pledge to not turn somebody away because of who they are. During that time, we realized it is a pain to manage corporate partnerships for both the corporate and the nonprofit side. And we're not alone. Every year, 10 billion with a B, billion dollars in resources that are allocated to be given back go undistributed because it's such a pain to do. And it's not because people hate charity, I hope. Uh, the problem is, is that services that are out there are expensive, take a ton of time, and aren't scaling with the changing uh, landscape of philanthropy which is why we built Selflessly. Selflessly is a B2B SaaS platform designed to build tools for every company and every employee to be able to give back. Our system can create an instant virtual foundation so employees can enter and, and give back, get matches through workplace giving programs, manage volunteer time off, and also manage any type of product or grants that can be distributed to the charitable sector. 
on the back end, a company now can show how kind and ethical they are and use our data to create a social impact report. We provide an entirely new data layer about employees and what they care about. And also, why not increase employee engagement with some philanthropy in the mix, right? So how do we know we're doing something right here? Well, our users are already reporting a 75% reduction in management time and a 50% increase in employee engagement, which is huge given the great resignation. Our system is already making significant impact. Last year, our users managed volunteer opportunities to go staff vaccination clinics across the state so we could rapidly increase vaccinations which is a big deal if you remember 2021 or if you blocked it out, that makes sense too. But I didn't build this, this platform alone. We've got a great team that come from both tech and nonprofit spaces, and we have a great diverse group of advisors from companies like Salesforce, SAP, AWS, and oddly enough, the Indiana Pacers. Our business model is an annual subscription that scales based on the size of the company and we have our core infrastructure and some upsell supplemental services that we can provide if a company has some personalized strategy that we need to maintain. We're excited. We're growing at 10% month over month with an over 145K in annual recurring revenue. The numbers on your right side are the, is the impact our users are making, and I'll let that speak for itself. We've got some cool companies, including Lending Tree, that are a part of our customer base. So how can you help? I'm glad you asked. We are currently raising our C round of funding. Uh, we would love any introductions to companies or investors that would be a good fit for a little tater like us. And as an only child, any attention and compliments are greatly appreciated. You feel free to tag us on all the socials at Give Selflessly. Thank I can you, tell Josh. You happy to answer your questions. Great job, Josh. Uh, way to roll with the the technology there uh, hiccup. And so I'll turn it over to the judges, but audience do not forget to uh, check the boxes on the poll there. Uh, we appreciate it. Josh Adam O'Donnell here. I'm also an only child. <laughs> Great stuff. Always appreciate the compliments, but what, what's your sales cycle? What, how many days? Your average? Yeah, we, we have found a, a, a big drive to start implementing these types of programs. So we are seeing about a 60 day on average sales cycle. Uh, back last year, it was about four months. So uh, companies are turning this on much faster, uh, which is great. Curious, on the unit economics front, how much service is involved in onboarding and supporting some of these larger enterprises like Lending Tree? Oh, yeah. Um, we're excited. We can turn on an account for a company no matter what size within 24 hours. In Lending Tree, we do have onboarding services where we can provide live training, but we actually have an automated walkthrough and tutorial videos. So in some cases, a company doesn't even want to use onboarding and they can do it themselves, which as an old child, really this whole thing. Uh, I like that attention. But. But yeah, um, it takes um, on Lending Tree side, um, I think a little less than eight hours on our side just to develop the specific uh, onboarding sequence for them. But really simple. That's awesome. I'm very impressive. Thank you. Thanks. Josh, we've seen a lot of market consolidation in this space. What's your exit strategy here? Yeah. So we have several companies that are interested in uh, spending more time with us, making it Facebook official, as we like to say. Um, but uh, the nice thing is we run lean and we're the last to market with the newest infrastructure. So we, we think that there's a real opportunity in the next few years to either be acquired or a, a joint venture to really start knocking out of the park uh, on philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. So we're building in that direction. Thank you so much, Josh, um, and uh, great job again. Uh, next up, the last uh, to go here, but certainly not the least, is Ceci Galban from Smart Sweet Tech. Ceci, go ahead and take it away. The stage is yours.
Sussy, we can't hear you if you're already started to talk here. There we go. There you are. All right. There. <laughs> All right. So you're seeing and hearing me? Okay, great. Well, I'm really honored to be here with all of you, but I'm gonna start by letting you in on a little something. Being on stage, even this virtual one, is terrifying for me, as you could just see. But it's a little embarrassing because I'm also a trained actor. Since I was a little kid, I wanted to be in show business. I was in every school play. I studied theater in college. Then I went to LA to start an acting career. Here's the problem. I really struggle. I have crippling stage fright. My heart pounds when I'm in my chest, my breath catches and my voice starts to waver. And my worst fear is that I'll forget my lines and I'm stranded in silence looking like a fool. So I made a switch. I took my theater training into corporate events and for the last 20 years, I've helped nearly 10,000 speakers give high stakes presentations at events around the world. Big events with companies like Walmart, Dell, ExxonMobil and Amazon. Here's the secret. Every one of those speakers was scared they'd forget their lines and be stranded in silence, feeling like a fool. But I'm here today because something's changed for me and now it's changing for them too. And that change is our product, Smart Notes. In fact, I'm using it right now. Our patented add-in works right in PowerPoint to solve a speaker's worst fears. It makes your notes visible, useful, readable, and clickable. So you can focus on connecting with your audience. And if you've ever looked at the presenter view in PowerPoint, you know that it's just okay. It was last redesigned in 2013 and competitors all have a similar version of this. It's low contrast, a small space for your notes. And if you have more than two tweets worth, you have to scroll while your heart is pounding and you're trying to connect. The notes are towards the bottom of the screen and your camera and your in-person audience are up here. Even presenters at Microsoft see the value of smart notes. It's why their head of virtual events is inviting us to run a pilot with them starting this summer. Our founding team is well connected in the corporate events industry. The three of us worked together on our first show almost 25 years ago. And because of these longstanding relationships, Nissan gave us the opportunity to do the first real world test of smart notes at their national sales meeting last month. 35 speakers over three days. The head of retail marketing called it a home run and asked us when they could have it on their computers. But the market isn't just those keynote speakers. It's every user speaking at monthly board meetings, QBRs, corporate trainers, and their collaborators, comms teams, internal SMEs, and external stakeholders like us. Smart Notes really creates efficiencies in the content process, saving time and money. We're targeting a global market of 54 million users, using a SaaS subscription model to generate recurring revenue, and we're raising a pre-seed round of 1.5 million for 18 months of runway. In that time, we'll complete the Microsoft pilot, launch to the public, mature the MVP, build the company infrastructure, and start developing Smart Notes for Google Slides. If you present with notes, you want smart notes. Thanks, and I hope you have questions. Great. Uh, judges, we'll have you join the stage with us for two minutes. Um, and then uh, polls have been launching, uh, but pay attention if you have a poll popping up, please go ahead and, and check that box. Ceci, so quick question. Um, this is Jason, I'm curious um, what your uh, kind of ideal. <laughs> well, I think it's natural that uh, these become part of the most popular presentation software. So we think that this is the presenter view of the future. So it is probably acquisition. <laughs> uh, we certainly want to build a, a company and we have a plan to do so, uh, but ultimately, this is a tool that should be a best practices for presentations. I appreciate that anecdote you threw out in the beginning. I personally am still terrified of public speaking, so <laughs> felt like I was living it. I'm curious with your first hires in the second half of this year, what is the number one priority for you guys in building out the business? Uh, technology, CTO, 
uh, we have three founders and none of us is a technical founder. So to get to the sort of bigger vision of our roadmap, we ha I mean, we have a very clear vision of where we want to go and who, and we're intimate with our customer. We see our customers every day at work, at our day jobs. So uh, really filling out the CTO and technology piece and probably fractional CFOs, a lot of the business side is where we need the most help and the most infrastructure. What do you think your best channel is for customer acquisition? Ah, well, our biggest channel will be event production companies. We also have great relationships with them. Um, we've already demoed to most of the big ones. We have, uh, we have a demo tomorrow with the Opus Agency, which uh, does a lot of events for AWS, for instance. Um, and they will be our channel partners. Uh, we also have some virtual event platform partners that we've spoken to, and they might include our, our add-in as part of the whole event platform offering to bring in their end clients, you know, clients like JP Morgan Chase and Amgen, big pharmaceutical companies, where we would then get a large user base. Have you talked to speaker coaches? I mean, I just did a session on Lots. stage tomorrow. The speaker <laughs> coach was so helpful. I mean, that seems like a yeah. great channel for you. Yes. Uh, I spoke with the speaker coach yesterday. Um, we spoke with, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of Decker, which is a big speech coaching company. They've seen our solution. We're meeting with them again so their broader team can see, see what we're offering. Excellent. Um, Thanks, Tessie, and thank you, judges. Well, folks, we have reached the end of the presentation portion of our session today, and I want to thank all of the founders for those excellent pitches. Judges, now it's going to be your show. We're going to send you guys off to the deliberation room where they're going to work with their liaisons to choose this year's winners. Uh, we're going to be bringing up a poll now where you, the audience, is also going to be able to vote for your favorite pitch of the night. Um, so go ahead and even if you already voted, if this poll popped up for you before, please vote again. This is the form you want to fill out and vote for your uh, audience favorite here. Um, and so now um, you can go ahead and during these 15 minutes, you can go talk to all these founders in the booths. Uh, they're going to be in there, use our networking lounges, communicate with each other and have a great time. You're going to be able to see this in about 15 minutes that we'll be announcing the winners and come back to this stage at that time. Thank you so much. We're doing the countdown starting now. See you soon. Welcome back, and it's time for the most exciting part of Demo Day. Our judges took the time to deliberate together, review the pitches, their notes, and decide this year's winners. So without further ado, the winning Audience Choice Award is for Geo Pogo. So let's give a round of applause. Yay, Geo Pogo. Our third place winner is Selflessly taking home $2,000. Great job, Selflessly. Our second place is Raya Health. Raya Health taking home $3,000 and that uh, award from Perfectly Pitched that they'll be uh, getting as well. And finally, this year's Demo Day first place winner goes to Carbon Reform. Great job, Carbon Reform. Congratulations. And congratulations to all the founders. Each of you presented a tremendous pitch today. You should be really proud of yourselves. You're fantastic. And thank you so much to everyone else here for participating today and you, the audience, for joining us. Now, if you've enjoyed the program, please consider a donation to start out by visiting startout.org slash donate or by scanning the QR code in our booth. Now, though the program is over, the networking lounges are open and you can still visit all of our founders inside of their booths. So please enjoy the rest of your evening, network with each other, and we can't wait to get see you again next year. Thank you again and have a great night.